Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Modern Web Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Osell. I am an architect at This.Labs. Uh, my co-host today is Jake Dome, a developer at Goodwork. Jake, how are you doing? Doing great. Excited. Good, good, good. And today I'm happy to say that we are talking about learning in public and code education and community building. And today we have an awesome guest to talk about that, Christina Gordon. She's a creative developer, a technical writer, and uh, somebody that likes to learn, uh, learn out loud to find jobs in tech and then teach people how to do that. So Christina, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well and I'm excited to talk to you both. Yeah, I'm, we're super excited to break into this. Jake and I both have visions of creating educational content online, so we are going to be picking your brain for, for all the useful tidbits that we can. But before we jump into that, first, I just want to give us a shout out to our sponsors. So our first sponsor for today is Sync Fusion. Essential JS2 is a web UI component suite of Sync Fusion that offers more than 65 modern UI components on all major web frameworks, Angular, React, Vue, JavaScript, ASP.NET, Core, ASP.NET MVC, and Blazor. You can start to build and deliver the high-performing and responsive web apps faster with great user experience. Also sponsoring us today is Progress. Kendo React is a professional UI and data visualization component library. Designed and built from the ground up specifically for React, Kendo React can augment any existing UI stack. Its 80 plus feature rich components and advanced functionality make it the perfect suite to standardize on and remove much of the complexity of working with multiple UI solutions. So we thank our sponsors for sponsoring this podcast and you know, now we're gonna dive right in. So to start us out, Christina, can you give us a little bit of a background on how it is you got into code education and you know, teaching uh, code? Yeah, so funny enough, before I got into teaching myself coding, I was in school to be an educator and an online educator. Um, and so I didn't, I got all the way to, you know, my internship and then I had my daughter and I just kind of dropped out and I stayed home for like five years and, and then I taught myself code. And so while I was teaching, I was or not teaching while I was learning, I was kind of putting in a lot of the practices that I had learned uh, from going to school for education. And while I was doing that, there was a lot of other like moms that I knew who were staying home. There are other people who, who wanted help and wanted to learn as well. And so I just kind of naturally was teaching while I was learning and getting into uh, development myself. And it's just kind of stemmed from there, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's super fascinating. You know, I think it's something that I didn't think about necessarily in the education space, but you know, I've done a lot of mentorship with junior developers. And sometimes I tell people that like, I've mentored a lot of junior developers, but not necessarily a lot of non-developers. And I think those skill sets are radically different. But the one thing which is definitely the same in both is that um, you learn a lot by teaching um, because, and I mean, you know this as a parent as well, having to answer that eternal why question <laughs> makes you have to know something much deeper than you would have been happy knowing it uh, themselves. So, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, a really good uh, thing that you're mentioning there. I mean, I think that's an important part of it for, I mean, it was probably really valuable to you to learn as you were, as you were teaching. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we, we homeschool our kids right now too. And so like, that's, that's definitely something I think about all the time when my daughter comes and she asks me like those hard questions, I think learning how to, to learn and, and teaching myself code, um, that's kind of encouraged them as well as like this, like, okay, it's all right to ask these hard questions. And if I don't know, I say, I don't know. And then we go and learn together. And that's the same practices I've had as I've been learning to code. Um, that was one of the things I did a lot when I was actually teaching students like every day was if I didn't know something, it was like, okay, I don't know, let's go figure it out. And just kind of diving into it and doing that because none of us know everything, right? No, we're not gonna know everything, but getting to that point where you're okay not knowing something and then knowing how to go after it and find those answers i think is really what helps people especially if they haven't been in programming just keep going and learning as uh as they're trying to break into tech yeah i totally agree i had an interaction the other day that was uh just really cool about someone who we were going back and forth online about a technical topic about accessibility and then we were talking about it after and she was just like, there's so much to know, but if you just get out there in the community and share what you know, uh, whether it's right or wrong, people are really gracious to respond. And so it can be intimidating because like you see all these people and they seem like they have a wealth of knowledge and some people really do. Um, but yeah, if you, I feel like if you get out there and you try to help and share with others, there's the 
as you like sow helpfulness into the world and as you help people, they'll help you back and you learn so much from putting your opinions out there, putting your thoughts out there, getting uh, not always gently corrected, but um, you know, the classic stack overflow slap on the hand sometimes happens. Um, but I think it's worth it. And, and the community is very um, accepting for the most part of uh, learners and beginners, um, especially some of those newer communities that are kind of, kind of growing up around beginners and really helping them, which I really appreciate. Yeah, definitely. I think just like you said, it is very intimidating. So if you're talking about like learning out loud or learning in public as you're going along, it is super intimidating. It's not something that you can say like uh, you don't have to fear because it's okay to have that fear. I think that's like a self-preservation thing, but you can go, you can go above that fear, like fear it and then do it anyways, and then see where you go from there. I think it's a big kind of, I don't want to say growth hack, but I used to tell students when I was teaching them, like, if you want to grow quickly, get good at asking questions. Even if you feel like you're that person asking that stupid question, you know, go on Stack Overflow. People feel like that all the time, like that they're that person mm -hmm. with the stupid question. So be that gracious person to answer, you know, someone's going to be that gracious person to answer that question for you. And then you can be that person too, as you keep growing uh, so that you don't have to be on Stack Overflow for one of those if you don't like it. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's lots of great communities. I, I'm a part of the dev community. So dev.co where they, you know, but a lot of coders are blogging on, but also people answer questions there. And I think it's okay to, to have that fear, to put yourself out there. Um, but you, there is a wealth of knowledge in the tech community. And a lot of people are, are happy to share that because people do have such, like, they do know certain things. Maybe they don't know everything, but if you have that question about that certain thing, then people are like, yes, I can answer that. And then they can help too. So, yeah, I agree. You know, it's funny too, because I feel like people's comfort levels and or their ability to be vulnerable might shift throughout their career and, and not just get linearly one way better or worse than another. I find it's, it can sometimes fluctuate. So like um, I was, I've always been a coder in, by career, by profession, but I did a lot of uh, web development when I was much younger. And then I did a lot of desktop development when I was through the most part of my career. And then I came back to web. When I came back, I still was a experienced developer but I had no problems asking questions I didn't know about the web because I was so thirsty to learn it. Like, how should I have known it? I haven't done it in so many years. But now it's like you find insidiously, it crawls back into your mind, this idea, well, well, I can't tell people that I don't know that. Like, if I ask that question, what if everybody's like, you're the only person that doesn't know that, then I'm a fraud. And it's funny that to tell people that you will never outgrow those feelings of being ashamed to ask a question and it's a continual challenge to, to remind yourself that it's okay to be vulnerable. And even if it is a quote unquote stupid question that you should know, at least you'll ask it, get the answer and be done with it. And then be on to the more difficult questions. I don't know, do you, do you, if you found the same? Yeah, definitely. Uh, when I, when I first, even when I was doing courses, say on my own, uh, some people came and asked me to do courses or whether I was teaching students live and live coding, that fear of just like, what if I don't know something or I say something wrong, especially like a recorded course that you're selling or something, right? If you say something wrong, <laughs> you get like that's like a very intimidating thing. But even, uh, you know, students, I'm teaching students, they're paying money to be at this school. If I like, there's that constant fear of like, well, what if I don't know this? And so it was kind of a daily challenge to get over that, like realize that I can't know everything and it's okay, but I can help people find the resources. Like I can do other things. Like if I don't know this answer, okay, I can help this student, this person, whoever it is, I can help them find the resources to get the correct answer. So I, I think it can also be challenging to to realize that you don't have to just keep talking and saying something if you don't know something <laughs> you can stop and you can say i don't know but let's find someone who does and let's let's get the you know get the information from them and this is how we find it you know googling is a is something that all of us do but it can be a very hard thing to know what to even look for so just helping someone mm -hmm. know like oh this is what you need to look for and then you can find the answer can be a huge help to people so yeah i think it's a daily i think it's a, a a challenge all the time to get over the fact that we just don't know everything. Yeah. I found it so interesting when I have that fear of not admitting that I don't know something or, you know, trying to kind of give as much of an answer as I can without just kind of saying, you know what, I don't know, let's find it out together. Um, I mean, if you're in a group in a community of like-minded people, 
who are on that same learning journey with you or even on your team, if your team is, um, uh, I don't want to say like if you're on a good team, but if you're on a team full of people who um, can help you in that way. And uh, I think most, I think all good teams should be a place where you can ask dumb questions, a place where you can ask any question. You get like, when you say, I don't know, and you're like, let's go learn that together. You get way more um, benefit out of that than if you try to come up with an answer, give it your best shot and say it like you know it. Um, because like the the humility there is really big. And, um, you know, just sticking to sticking to what you know. And then like you're saying, if you don't know the answer, you can still have so much value in just helping them get to the answer, whether they're asking you or whether you're asking a question. Um, you might know enough about it. They're like, oh, really cool that they knew these parts of it. Like they don't know about Gatsby, but they know static site generators are cool and they do these things, whatever it is. So there, I always get value out of it. When I take the leap and I say, I don't know, let's learn it together. Or when I ask the, the seemingly dumb question, uh, I always get, I, I feel like it's almost always positive experience when I actually take the leap and do that. It's just getting getting over that hump in my mind takes a little bit of work, but definitely worth it. Yeah, I'll tell you what though, I also, what I do to help with this is whenever I find myself looking at someone online and I go, wow, that was a dumb question. I can't believe that person didn't know that, which I'm overselling it, but we all have these thoughts sometimes. We, you know, we do that. We go, oh, I can't believe that person didn't know that. What I do is I remember that person. I try to follow them forward. And what I'll always see is that person gets so much smarter, so much faster. And then I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it was worth asking that because within a week, it was, they were asking the right questions. Within two weeks, they were asking innovative questions. And within a couple of months, they were a thought leader on that topic. And I was like, so I use that as a way to break down my own fears of putting myself out there uh, as well. But I, I agree. Yeah, I, uh, I, it's, it's a huge just like way exactly like you said to push forward and grow and be better like the times that even today i had like before i got onto the podcast i was working i'm working with my my team and i'm i'm editing this article on information that i don't necessarily know and i was getting stuck on a problem and finally i was just like hey um i have a blocker here i'm stuck on this i have no idea how to move forward and immediately i got oh you could do this or this and like you know people giving me some solutions that i just didn't even think of because i didn't know those things are around. So it's a, it's a huge way to grow and not get blocked and keep going. So I was, Christine, I'm really curious to know, um, you know, you have this background in education as well. And then, and then, you know, you participated in uh, some different code schools and, and educational things here. So I'm curious if you have any advice or thoughts about sort of the state of more formal code education. So not like the stuff that we're, we will be talking about with like Egghead and things like that, but like people that pay money to go to these code academies or boot camps and things like that. You know, if you have any general thoughts about kind of the state of code education um, trends, or if people are looking to join a boot camp, anything that you would recommend that they consider or ask questions about before signing on? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really big and, and weighty question for a lot of people. There's There's a lot of, if, if you are trying to teach yourself, like I taught myself development, uh, you have to have a certain mindset for that. And you also have to have a certain kind of community around you that helps you do that. Like I had my husband who was, you know, helping me with the kids so I could study and things like that. Not everyone has that kind of support. And so some people do want to go to like a boot camp so they can have something where they have this support and people helping them and they have a focus and they have like, this is what you're going to learn and then this and this. And so I would say like, one, keep that in mind. Like it, boot camps aren't for everyone, uh, but they do help some people and they help, well, I think they help a lot of people. Uh, but there are also a lot of things to kind of be maybe weary about with a lot of boot camps, like it, it just like depends. Um, I think there's a lot of controversy around them right now from, from when I was teaching at one to like even now, like I know there's a lot of controversy around the payment systems around them. You know, you have to be really knowledgeable about like what you're getting into when you sign on to like ISAs or different things like that. Like there's a lot, it, it can seem like, oh, this school is free, when it's not, <laughs> uh, just like, you know, getting a loan to go to college, like you're still going to be paying money. And so being aware of all of that kind of stuff can be really hard for people who just want to move forward and they, they want a better thing. Like I was living in, you know, uh, you know, I didn't have much money. And so tech made that huge for me, like getting into tech. 
And so a lot of people want that for themselves and they can jump into these things without either knowing, like maybe not even their fault. They just think like, oh, I heard that this ISA was something that I could have and sign on to and I don't have to pay. And then I only have to pay this much. Well, maybe there's some stipulations around that and people need to be aware of those things and really looking into them. Plus stuff like curriculum, like uh, some boot camps are earlier in their development. Well, their curriculum is probably shifting a lot and it's probably not at a place that's like super great. Like I've experienced uh, helping boot camps create their curriculum. Well, students were already in those boot camps while that was happening. So that's something else to consider as well. Um, I mean, and sometimes it's not a boot camp's fault. Sometimes things just change. I came to the boot camp when they react changed to hooks. And so we were changing the whole curriculum to hooks and, you know, some things like that just happened. But those are all things to kind of think about and consider as you're moving forward. Yeah, yeah I've so got a I question. Oh, yeah, oh. I got a question on that about boot camps because I'm, uh, I don't know if I would quite say self-taught, but I, I started learning. I took a couple week course on HTML when I was really young. And I was like, this is cool. Did some WordPress stuff and then um, learned at an agency. I had a really awesome opportunity to kind of come on as an intern, learn through that. So half self-taught, half a lot of blessings along my journey. Um, but I've really enjoyed the self-taught path, but I've wondered about um, like boot camps and do you feel like they accelerate even even if you are driven and you can learn on your own um do you th do you think they generally do help you accelerate that learning path because it compresses right it gives you goals and deadlines and stuff even yeah i think i'm a pretty driven learner and i've learned a lot at my jobs whether it's related to what i do or not um but i still think there is some good value in uh, setting those goals pretty aggressively and helping you get through those um, I know they're not for everyone, so I'm just trying to get some input on what you think about like how it accelerates the learning path of even someone who might feel like they're driven enough to learn on their own. Yeah, well, I think just from off the bat, like especially if it's a full-time program, you're dedicating like eight hours plus every day just to learning. Uh, so you're going to accelerate because of that. Like when I was teaching myself, I had an hour a day that I could learn. Like I did the 100 days of code because yeah. I was like, I need an hour a day. I need to focus. And, you know, I still got somewhere pretty quickly in, in my case. But uh, yeah, you have time dedicated to that but you still have to put in the work so a boot camp can they can teach you but it's the same especially the online ones like what I was teaching you're you're still watching someone teaching you something so mm -hmm. if you're not paying attention if you're not putting the work into the projects if you're just grabbing code and putting it in so you complete the project it's the same as when someone's at school it's easy to cheat right like if you're cheating you're cheating yourself and mm -hmm. you're still not going to progress so yes I saw students plenty of students because I was teaching the first half of um, the curriculum, the front end, I saw plenty of students who got way past like anything I could do. They'd come back and ask me questions. I'm like, listen, you're doing stuff that I don't do. And <laughs> that's not like my area of focus. And yeah, I think it can be great. And it definitely can accelerate. And I saw a lot of students go to like, where they knew nothing. And we were teaching them, you know, HTML and stuff like that to where they were building full applications and then working at Google. Like all students do that, but it's not always the case. And I think it's still that has to be that mindset of like, okay, I need to dedicate myself and I still need to put in the time and I still need to learn because one of the downfalls I think that I saw at a boot camp was that they thought because they went to a boot camp and they completed it, they would get a job. And sometimes that's kind of the promise, right? At these boot camps. Well, here's the thing. If you're not learning and you're cheating or you're doing stuff and you're not putting in the mm -hmm. time, those companies are going to hire you because they're going to see that you can't do those projects or you can't do what they need. And so then students wouldn't get hired. So I think it's, it's a, a balance that you have to have still. Yeah. Very mileage may vary. And I, I would just make an, I would advocate for people to be cautious, especially on Twitter of getting absorbed into what some people will, what are the value judgments on these various paths? even just lightly pushing back, Jake, this idea of if you're driven enough to do, um, to do self-taught, I think it's really learning styles. And I know that's not what you meant, but like it is learning styles. Like I worked with somebody who said the only reason he went to college is because he got a piece of paper at the end of the day. He'd learn so much more and enjoy it so much more picking the books he wanted to read and reading those books and learning. I know other people that they're like, no, I only learn well building products, shipping real products. And um, and then there's others like me, I went to get a master's degree, not because I necessarily needed it, because I like structured education. That's, I love that inspiration. So I think for people too, if you're 
if you're struggling with learning coding, maybe it's a sign that the path you're taking isn't actually your learning style. And so if that's try a boot camp, if you're not in the boot camp, or if that's uh, maybe the boot camp wasn't for you, maybe to try the self taught route or, or just get an internship and just start trying to do, I, I would have advocate for that as well for people. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I mean, I, I, I used to say that a lot too, because, you know, even teachers, right? So there were a couple of us teaching, everyone's going to have a different teacher they connect better with, or that type of teaching that teacher does, they're going to like better. And we, I think most of us have experienced that going through school. Like there were teachers that you liked, that you learned from, and then there were teachers that you're like, I, I can't learn from this. Same when you're watching videos or you're trying to teach yourself. Um, I think so it's, sometimes you have to kind of get over that hump. Like maybe it's not me right at this moment moment maybe it's just this particular teaching style and exactly like you said maybe this isn't working maybe I need to try something else and I saw it a lot with um, students I see it a lot with people who are trying to teach themselves as well that like there's this like I actually one of the first things I did before I started teaching myself development was I took the learning how to learn course that's really popular I think it's on course Coursera possibly um, because I wanted to make sure that I was I knew how to learn well before I started learning development again like it had been a little while since I was in school so I was like okay I'm gonna teach I'm gonna do this course and I think being aware of like your learning style exactly like you said can really really help you move much quicker than like uh, and you and getting over that so that you're not stuck where you're feeling like oh I just can't do this a lot of people just get to the point where like I can't do this I can't learn when really maybe just what the way they're learning right then is not working for them Great. So I know beyond just being a, a code educator and a developer, you, you've also done some online educational materials and with a couple different platforms, actually. I, so I don't remember which one came first, whether it was the Egghead or the, the LinkedIn, but I'm just kind of curious for that first opportunity you had to build those online materials. How did that arise? Like, how, how did you get into that? How did, how did you become aware of it? How did you decide your topic? Like, kind of how did that get kickstarted for you? Yeah, so the actual, the first, so Egghead and LinkedIn are the ones I'm kind of working with now. The first one I worked with was Skillshare. Uh, so that's uh, uh, all kinds of things on there, not just um, development stuff. And they actually uh, emailed me at some point. They saw my code pins. They saw like I, I was like the whole learning out loud in public. I was constantly creating code pins and sharing it and putting stuff out there. And they wanted a particular course. They had a particular course in mind of CSS and they wanted this kind of more advanced CSS, but with like animations and stuff. And so they approached me and asked me. And I was like, okay, I, that, at that time I was like a year into development and I did not feel confident at all, but it was something that I felt like would be really good for me um, uh, to keep learning, to keep progressing. That exactly like you said earlier, if you teach someone something, you're going to learn it better. And so I worked with them and that Skillshare was nice because there was structure. Like they had this like, okay, you're gonna have a week to, or two to come up with the material. You're gonna have a week of recording. We're gonna have a week of uh, production and then, you know, that's it. And so for me, I was like, okay, I can spend this time. I can dedicate that time and do it. Um, then I worked with Design uh, Code, which is a their designers learning to code type of thing. Um, and I was working there like full time. And so that was a little bit different. It was just kind of like, all right, we're going to come up with course concepts that we think people want to learn and we're going to create the material. And I had to kind of give myself a deadline for that one. Like I had to be like, okay, I need to get this done in this time. Uh, especially Meng, who I worked with, he was amazing and would get courses out like super fast. So I had to be like, all right, let me, let me figure that out. Um, Egghead and LinkedIn are very, very different as well. So Egghead is, um, I, I put out an article on Twitter that I had done on Greensock, which is an animation library. And Joel, who is the owner of, one of the owners of uh, Egghead was like, hey, we would love if you would teach this stuff on Egghead, are you interested? And I was like, yes, great, sure. And so um, there was actually a long period where I was like, trying to start doing them but when I was working at Lambda there was some clauses where I couldn't teach uh, so I couldn't start doing it until after I was done there um, and their process is kind of you do whatever like what do you think you want to teach uh, what do you want to learn if you've just learned something go out and teach it right then because of the whole process of like yeah it's great if you learn something and you teach it to someone you're it's going to stick for you and you're probably in this empathetic state where it's going to help other people right um, and so 
they also, you do very short videos and it's very to the point. So there's no like intro, like, hey, I'm Christina Gordon. This is blah, blah, blah. This is me. Okay, let's get into this information. No, it's like you tell them exactly what you're doing and they're short videos so that people can get this information quickly and then, you know, go about their day or whatever. LinkedIn is very different. <laughs> LinkedIn is a, is uh, the way I got in contact with them is I saw they were hiring on, I think, Women Who Code job board, one of, one of those job boards. I saw they were looking for people to teach, and so I just reached out, and they got back to me that same day, and they're like, hey, we'd love for you to teach. We see you've taught before, and then we started this process. So then I worked with a content developer for like two or three months to come up with a concept, and I had to come up with an outline. And then just yesterday, I met my producer and we came up with, okay, this is the timeline for you're going to create your script. Uh, you have slides. They definitely have like an intro, a conclusion. There's a lot more stuff there than like say an egghead course where you're just like to the point. So they're, they're, they are very different. It's been weird. Uh, when I sent them my like initial video, they were like, yeah, that's good. But could you have like some more hey, this is who I am type of stuff. Like I had to edit it because I was in this mindset of like the egghead style. So it was a lot different. I think that uh, like a couple of points there. Uh, I think like that different in style is so neat because it goes back to people's different learning styles where someone further along or just who is just trying to learn stuff quick um, might really love like an egghead. You know, like I learned React hooks in six minutes with egghead, right? Like, but some people might want a more personal experience, a more, hey, here's who I am, here's where I'm coming from, here's some anecdotes about code, and like people love that different styles, and I'll be talking to someone in the back, oh yeah, I was listening to this course, and, and I really didn't like it, I was like, I loved that course, so it's so funny, because there can be such a personal difference between them, so it's really cool that they're not all the same, um, and then my other follow-up was, uh, I think that we talked about earlier, learning out loud, um, learning in public. And I think that's so powerful because uh, like you talked about, you got one of these opportunities based on an article. You got another one based on another, uh, you know, course that you did. And like, I think, and your code pins, right? So as you put stuff out into the world, the opportunities start to, it's like a snowball effect, right? And I think that's so, so cool. And so that would be one thing that I definitely, for people who are trying to build, um, a career around education, helping others, things like that. I definitely encourage learning in public, share as you learn, make code pins and tweet them. Even if you have six followers, like that's how you pick up traction, make cool stuff and put it in front of people in like a way of just like, Hey, here's what I learned. Maybe you can learn something from it. And uh, people get so much value from that, especially coming from that personal empathetic place. Like you were talking about, like, I just learned this and it was really like, I've like regex for me. Like one day I'm going to make a killer regex course because I will well, be so empathetic once I learn it because right now I'm so scared of it. Um, you know, that type thing, you learn something and uh, you're able to share in a way that other people haven't, they haven't experienced it like you. And so I think that's just such an important piece of this is those opportunities. If someone's like, how do I get into education? Start doing something in public in front of people. And I'm not saying all those opportunities will come knocking at your door, um, but they do build. So, yeah. Yes. And so when I, uh, when I left Lambda, I didn't have a job yet, but these kinds of things that I was doing, they led to the, all the different kinds of contract work I have right now and the opportunities that I have right now, because people saw my stuff out there and then they're like, oh, this is cool. Hey, do you think you could work on this? And right now is this weird period in time where, you know, uh, you know, we have COVID, we have all kinds of things going on and companies are a little hesitant to bring people on full time, but getting contract work has been <laughs> pretty easy actually for me right now because I can be like, oh, uh, do you need technical writing? I can do that. See, here's stuff where I've written or do you need me to do some courses? Uh, even having the opportunity to do courses on Egghead or LinkedIn was a source of income for me. You know, it's a way that I can build some income while I don't have a full-time job. So it is, it is something where, yeah, these opportunities might not necessarily come to you, but what I've found, and this is different for everyone, what I found is if you're willing to kind of put that stuff out there, so many people aren't willing to that all these companies that, that need this material are probably going to reach out to you because they're like, look, there's someone that will do it. Sweet. Let's, let's get them. And so it, it's definitely something that I think people can build up. And uh, like you said, if you have six people, like when I started coding, 
I had never been on Twitter. I started a Twitter and then I did like 100 days of code and I did something called daily CSS images. And that's when I started sharing like my cool code pins. And then my following grew from there. It, it's exactly right. You can just kind of build an audience and uh, benefit from it yourself by learning from other people. Cause I learned a ton. People would be like, Oh, this is really cool. Maybe you could try this. And I'm like, Oh, let me figure out how to do that. <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. To your point about hiring too. I mean, it's, it's so helpful from, I've been a part of a couple of hiring processes. I've talked to a lot of people who have, and like the easiest way to know if someone can do a job once you hire them is, are they doing it before you hire them? Right? Like if you want to know, can someone teach people when we hire them? If you can look and be like, that's not a question. They're already teaching hundreds of people. They already have this following of people who love their teaching style. That just, that helps so much versus cold applying for especially educational type positions. I mean, development's kind of the same way. That's a little harder to prove in public, I feel like, than um, teaching and education type stuff. So it's just, yeah, when, when you see someone out doing the work, it just makes the, uh, the call about, hey, would you come help us with our education, makes it so easy for a company because they know you've got the, you've got the goods. Um, so I, I have a question about um, the, the you know, courses and how you decide what courses to do. So you have experience with React. You know, obviously, we know that in the React space, someone like a Kent Dodds is like a prolific React educator. I, I came in from Angular space. I, you know, Dan Whalen, Deborah Carada, all these people just like huge names. And you're like, oh my gosh, I could never do what they have already done. It would just always be a cheap copy. Now we know that that's a self-defeating mentality that that's an imposter syndrome speaking. But I guess my question to you is, is how do you decide the topics? Because there's this interesting business perspective of finding the niches that aren't occupied, but maybe the thing that you know is in the space that somebody else kind of quote unquote dominates. So how have you decided and navigated that? as far as deciding which topics to cover and build courses off of? Yeah, so my, what I teach uh, as far as like, say like green sock. So Sarah Drasner is like a huge green sock person at SVG. I actually learned a ton from her. And when I thought of teaching those things, which I was like, why? Because someone's done this before. But the way I teach is different than the way she teaches and the way I was doing some of the stuff. So I also try to think of different ways. So, uh, you know, someone might be teaching animations, but they're teaching someone how to do animations, right? Like learn this initially, which is kind of how LinkedIn and I came about. Like we were like, okay, uh, there's Val Head who did this amazing CSS animation course on LinkedIn. We have that, that's here. We don't need you to teach CSS animations, but can we build on that? So I'm teaching, how do you use these animations in a UI? How do you use that appropriately? Like there's like different things that you can kind of expound on that stuff. But I also think <laughs> sometimes we have to get over the fear of, just like when people talk about blog posts, like, oh, you might not wanna write a blog post because everyone's written that blog post, right? Well, we all have a different voice. We all have a different perspective and we all have a different way. Some people can copy things exactly. And I think you have to be careful about that, especially now that I do like a lot of copy editing and um, a lot of like technical writing. I see that a lot. But I think there are always ways that we are going to come from a different perspective and a different way of teaching stuff. And it's going to connect with people in a different way. And I think we have to just kind of, it, it's, it is hard. It is hard to get over the fact that like, oh yeah, so many people know this. Even at Egghead, they talk about it all the time. And one of the reasons I really love them is like, we don't care if there's already like 20 videos of someone teaching React, like Kent t taught React on there, right? <laughs> you have a different perspective and you have a different way you're going to teach this, put it out there. Someone's going to enjoy it and someone's going to like it. And I've seen that over and over now that I've been willing to kind of do that. But yeah, I think there is this initial like, uh, there, someone else is already doing this and they do it really well. Like, how am I even going to put something out there? Uh, it's definitely a, a fear I think is valid. So. Well, that wasn't a uh, hypothetical question. Rob and I are just using this podcast to ask you personal questions because we want to know what stuff to make courses about. Um, but yeah, I totally agree on all of that. And uh, a little experiential story. I wrote a blog post last year about function parameters in JavaScript, which is like the first thing you learn. It's like maybe second, like vari variables, functions, parameters. And it got like 10,000 views pretty quickly or something. And I was like, no way do this many people want to learn how to write like 5% better function parameters. You know, there's probably 500 articles on that. So it's kind of emboldened to me. And hopefully it does to other people to be like, 
go write a blog post about variables in JavaScript because it'll help someone. There's, there might be 6 million posts about variables in JavaScript, but maybe they're old. Maybe you'll have a new perspective, um, new language, new way to think about it that helps people. So yeah, put it out there. For, um, for people that are looking to do this, so uh, you know, I think for somebody that's coming into a cold, maybe aware that this exists, but not really sure how to get into it. I mean, I think two things prone into people's minds. Now, one of them you covered a bit, which is um, which, which uh, platform to go with. And the other is there's been a big movement now for people to kind of self-publish this idea of why give up any piece of the pie. So I guess my question to you is, have you, have you considered this self-publishing route as well? And do you have any feedback or advice for people, just like with the boot camps, uh, before they dive into this, before they start engaging in these conversations, any advice on how they should think about where to release their content, how to release it, uh, any clauses or things that they should be aware of in contracts to be careful about, or things along that, along those lines. Yeah, so there's always pluses and minuses to both. And I saw a good uh, kind of thread today about self-publishing a book versus like going with someone else. And I think this is very similar. So something like LinkedIn, um, they get most of the money made off of the courses, right? you still get a good chunk of it, uh, uh, you get a percentage, but they're gonna get most of the money. And the reason they're gonna get most of the money is because they have hundreds of thousands of customers or more already, and you're gonna get all of those customers seeing your stuff, they're gonna promote it, they're also doing the editing. So there's a lot to courses that you have to think of. There's the coming up with the content, there's the recording the videos yourself, having the equipment to do that. Um, there's the editing, which I'm not great at, and that's the process, like probably why I go with other <laughs> platforms, because I'm like, yes, you do the editing, will be good. Um, and then there's the promotion afterwards. And so it's a lot of work. It can be like a full-time job just to, to put your own course out there. And there are people who have that as their full-time job. Think of like West Boss or, you know, different people like that. That is their full-time job because it takes a lot of time. Um, when you're working with a different platform, um, it depends on the platform. So like, again, Egghead is one that probably gives the most I've seen in Royal and they have an audience already. Uh, the nice thing about Egghead and some of the other ones I've worked on is that you own, I can't create a course that's the same or similar to LinkedIn while my stuff is there. So like, okay, what am I putting myself into? Because there was a specific course that I decided not to do for LinkedIn because I want to have a lot of other LinkedIn. Probably would have done good. It would have been a good idea. Uh, but I knew that I couldn't use that other places if I did. And so I picked something that I was fine with just having on LinkedIn. Like, that's fine. Um, so definitely consider all these things. Read the contracts you get, which are often huge, <laughs> but you have to take the time to read them so you understand, like, is this material mine? Is it theirs now? What happens to it? Like, who's this being sent off to? Uh, who's doing the promoting? There's a lot of stuff that you have to be aware of. And when you're doing it, publishing, you don't have to worry about that, but you also do have to worry about other fees you might incur, buying equipment, things like that. And then if you don't have a big audience already, it's probably going to be hard for you to get like a lot of people looking at your stuff. Like, yes, I have like maybe 6,000 followers, People who have like 50,000 or more, that's where I've seen they've had the most success if they've done something like self-publishing or doing their courses and trade-offs. Uh, I like working with the companies that I'm working with because they do a lot of the leg, you know, the, the leg work of like, they're going to produce it. Uh, they're going to help me come up with an idea and they're going to do the editing, which I don't want to do. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. Yeah. That's, that's, there's a lot of really helpful thoughts there. Again, not a hypothetical question. Rob is shamelessly <laughs> using your knowledge for his own gain here. Um, but um, yeah, no, I was just thinking about that too, because some people really want to be like, you know, take care of all of that. They want it to be their baby. They want to do every piece of it, micromanage every piece of it, not in a bad way, in a great way. And some people want to record a couple lessons, you know? And so there's such a difference there too. And like some people are good at promotion and some people don't like promoting their stuff as much and they want or need help with that. So it's such a big part of it. It's like, do you, you have to decide like, like what things are important to you, invest in those things and delegate the rest and then find a company to work with or self-publish if you want to do it all, find partners to help you with the the pieces that don't really fit into your strengths. Awesome. Yeah. So 
we kind of covered formal code education uh, and then we've covered sort of the online courses and I, th I think like the third category that we had to talk about was sort of communal learning um, and you know one of the things that I think a lot of people might be familiar with is like the hundred days of code hashtag and movement of people trying to get into and learn coding and honestly if you are a senior engineer or anybody that that's already in the coding and you're not following that hashtag on Twitter to reach back and be inspired and encourage people, you're missing out and you're not doing your job because it is a fun thing to follow and to give people kudos when they share their first project. Um, it's such a cool way for people to kind of get that sense of community and, and learn that. And that kind of, Christine, inspired you to work on 100 days of cloud. I'm kind of curious if you could kind of give us an introduction to that um, and what that's about and, and how, how you got involved with that. Yeah, so one of the uh, contracts I'm currently working with, Andrew Brown, he's at Exam Pro, where they do courses. Uh, he's got a ton of free content on Free Code Camp, where he's got all these, like, there was a big push for people to get certified in the cloud, um, and he did a bunch of AWS courses, and, and now more, not just AWS. And at the time, I was doing a lot of the lecture notes for him, for his courses, for their actual platform. And we were, so it's kind of interesting. The 100 Days of Cloud got kind of brought together from a, a couple different places. So Andrew and I were working on that. Um, some other people in the community were working on some other things too, also at the same time with the cloud. And we've all kind of like realized we were doing similar stuff. Hey, let's help other people do this as well. Um, Andrew asked me if I would do a, a blog post, like, hey, can you do like 100 Days of Code and do a blog post and learn something new every day and teach it and put it out there. And so that's what I started doing. And then there were also people who were like building some bots and doing some other things. And so we kind of just formed it more formally. So we have like a LinkedIn group, we have a Discord channel. We now have our actual GitHub like repository where they have all the information. Yesterday, they finally just got all these videos out of like, okay, this is how you get started. And it's just really encouraging people to start learning about the cloud. I think even just saying the cloud confuses some people. Like I did a blog post on like, what is the cloud? And that got a lot of views because people just don't know what the cloud is. And so, um, I've seen kind of this like progression right now in web development where a lot of even me looking for jobs like people want you to have that information and that knowledge and so it's just been a way to like encourage people to learn that so that they can uh, progress and maybe get these jobs that a lot of other people aren't getting because they don't have those like certifications and it's just encouraging people to to study giving them a plan and helping them share it just like we were talking about learning in public, share it so that people see it. So just like the 100 days of code or the 100 days of X, like where they, they have 100 days and you're sharing and you're, you're saying what you're learning and you're working on projects, we're doing the same thing just within kind of the cloud community. That seems, yeah, that's really, really neat. Um, so the 100 days is, uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty long amount of time. Do most people do, is there like set expectations for what most people do? Is it an hour a day, five minutes a day, write some code, sit down and write some code at least once a day for a hundred days? What's the format kind of look like for most people's pacing? Yeah, so the actual hundred days of code challenge, I, I did do that. It, that was, it was very particular, like, okay, you would do a hundred days. You were gonna try to do a hundred days straight. You needed to spend at least an hour and it didn't need, it wasn't supposed to be spending an hour learning something it was supposed to be spend the hour actually doing a project because you're supposed to we all not everyone but people tend to get into this like tutorial like i'm going to watch a tutorial i'm going to do a tutorial and they never like put anything into practice and so i think that was the original idea behind 100 days of code um similar with 100 days of cloud we're not strict like it has to be we want consistency, but like if you do like one day, you skip a day, you do the next day, it's not going to like really count against you or anything like that. But we are encouraging people to follow kind of this template that we have of like, okay, here, here's this huge list of projects you could work on if you wanted to. And we're encouraging people in the community to add projects as they're thinking about them. Like we have a way for people to contribute to the GitHub and, and all of these things. And as they're going, okay, here's some templates and then share. Um, we have like a small template, like if they just want to really quickly say like what they learned. And then we have a longer one where we're trying to encourage people to learn how to blog and, and actually put out their ideas and teach people 
because Andrew has such a good connection with like Free Code Camp too, that's something where they've talked about like maybe they can be published on Free Code Camp if these are actually like structured in a certain way as well. So trying to help people uh, not only just learn, but also kind of put themselves out there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really neat. And I've, I mean, I've definitely found in my um, career, just like the, being in community is so helpful for so many different reasons. Encouragement, encouraging other people is so good for me. Like not only getting encouragement, but giving encouragement. And like Rob was saying, like the, you see all these people are so hungry for it. It's like sometimes when you're a little down, like I don't want to do it. And then you see some people doing stuff and they're like, oh my gosh, I love JavaScript or I really don't like JavaScript, but I'm doing it anyway. It might be a more common sentiment, but um, yeah, it's just so cool. Um, so I wanted to bring up one more thing related to community, which is something you mentioned earlier that really struck me was talking about how your husband was really there for you through this. And I was just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on community outside of tech that encourages you to, as you're learning code or as whatever you're trying to learn. Um, I just thought that was a really interesting point too, because I tend to get focused on my in tech community and my Twitter community and things like that. Um, but it kind of made me realize that your community outside of tech, outside of your day job, whether you have another community full of, you know, whatever else you're doing, uh, gardening, cooking, um, you know, whatever biking, mountain biking, whatever fun things you're doing on the side and your local community of your family or whatever it might be is really important too. Um, so I just wanted to see if you had any other thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's, everyone's in a different place in their life, right? So like I was a mom at, at the time, I had three kids at four now when I was learning. Um, so for me, I really, I really did dive into like the tech community when I could and I wanted the encouragement there, but I had to have that outside help too. So like I, I was near my mom and uh, we had horrible, horrible internet. So we had like 3G and no oh, like man. connection. So I would have to go to the library for that like hour. Like I'd have to go drive to the library. So she would watch my kids so I could do that. There was no way I was going to be able to do like all these things without this like community that I had. And, um, you know, my husband now, he watches the kids while I work and stuff like that. Like that's, that's a huge thing. Not everyone has that. And so if you can find that community that can encourage you and keep you going, I think it's definitely very helpful. Um, and I, I definitely, feel my luck in that, that I did have that community as I was learning because I, you know, when I was a teacher at Lambda, I did see those students who had like nothing, like they had nothing and they didn't have that community. And so it, it's hard, <laughs> you know, it's hard for people. Yeah. And I, I definitely know that. And I feel that. Yeah. yeah. And I guess even when you're in your tech community too, finding a community of people who are empathetic to your particular situation, um, I know like moms who code is a hashtag, uh, dads who code. So finding people who are kind of on the same page as you and have similar shared experience. Um, uh, as a 20 year old with no kids, I don't have that same experience. So I can't empathize in the same way that other people might. So yeah, trying to find that like-minded people who can really partner with you and just encourage you. I, and I'll, I mean, what I'll advocate for listening to all this too, is just saying that hiring in tech is way harder than it needs to be. Um, uh, getting a job in tech. I, if you aren't already meet some of these people that are going through boot camps that are doing this hundred days of code, talk to them, see the projects they're turning out. And if you can remember far enough back for me, it's getting harder every year. Remember back to where you were when you got your first job. I'm telling you, these people blow away any expectation I had of myself for the first several years I was working it is way too hard. So anything you can do where you have reached to do it to break down some of those barriers and give these people a chance, please do. Because these people are truly impressive and they bring energy like you would not believe to your organization. I don't know, Christina, you probably agree <laughs> with that. All right, Rob, you cut off at the end there. <laughs> uh, my, my internet was cutting in and out a little. Um, so yeah, I think I got what you were saying though, talking about the the people who are learning and trying to get into jobs right now. Um, I even when you know I got into tech like four years ago, and what I had to have to get my first job is way different than what people are having now. And when students would ask me, "Hey, how did you get into tech?" I would always say, "Okay, listen, I'm going to tell you how I got into tech." But I know I was super lucky with the first job that I got, and this is not normal. <laughs> like, and I wish it was normal. No, it wasn't. And so I would tell them, but I would also say like, here's some realities around this right now and the things you kind of work towards and when you are applying for jobs, because I could say, look what I did on day one versus what I did on day 
100. <laughs> like there was a huge, you know, difference between like the stuff I was putting out on day one versus the stuff I was putting out on day 100. And I could be like, hey, look, look how much I can learn in that amount of time and really prove to like an employer that like I was worth like hiring, right? Although I think you shouldn't have to have that, but hey, that's okay. <laughs> Okay, and so uh, to usually we wrap up with some closing thoughts, but we're getting really close to time here. And I had this on my list of questions I wanted to ask you. And so I'm going to be indulgent and take the conclusion for one last question, which is we've been doing a lot of hiring recently. And one of the questions I always ask people is to self-evaluate their knowledge of CSS. It just is an intro question to lead to follow-up questions. And I always add to the top of the list now, do you consider yourself to be an expert or know enough to be dangerous or and then a couple levels below that? And what's hilarious is ever since I've added the expert level to that list of things I give them to choose between, the thing I always get back is, well, I'm not that type of person that can go and like craft a medieval painting using only divs. And uh, so, so the reason I introduce it that way is because when I saw your code pens, I saw there were some, I mean, you wrote a course on it, but some really cool animations throughout that. And it strikes me as like one of these few places in web development where people can really just do a a really micro version of their own creativity and their capabilities. And I guess my question to you is, is do you think that other than just the fun of doing it, that there is additional educational value of going kind of over and above what might be on any reasonable website that anybody would ever work on, but to really push themselves to do something interesting like that? Like, what are your thoughts on, on sort of that novel CSS and animations and stuff that people do? I'm going to assume you all can hear me. My internet's being a little crazy right now, but uh, so I, I'm pretty sure I got the gist of that. You're going above and beyond. Like uh, the way I learned CSS and I became comfortable doing CSS and then moving on to other things was that I did go a little over the top. So I was like, if I wanted to learn something new about CSS, some new CSS property, I was like, like, let me see where I can push this to. And then that really like put that into my head, like, oh, I really understand this. Like I felt confident and that I did understand that. So while I, I would probably also like, actually, you, you like I probably wouldn't say I'm an expert in something, but <laughs> I do think uh, I, I definitely uh, encourage like the the images, the paintings and stuff like that. Like what is the purpose behind this? One, sometimes it's just okay to have fun and do silly things and have no purpose behind it. And that's great. And if that's encouraging you to keep going and learning, then do those things. And while it seems like there might not be a purpose, that person knows way more CSS than a lot of pe other people and probably can do some impressive websites in a way that is nor normal. Like they're not going to do those crazy things, but that's how I've gotten contracts to do. Like they knew I could dial it back and do something for a website that they needed or a game or something like that. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing. Yeah. I would definitely recommend that you all look out for Christina's code pens and, and get inspired by them because they are a lot of fun to poke through. Uh, but that's it for today. That went by really quickly. So thank you so okay. much, everybody, for listening to this modern web podcast on learning in public, code education, and community building. Thank you to our guest, Christina. Uh, as always, the conversation does not stop here. So if you want to, if you have any additional questions or thoughts that you wanted to share, you can find us all online. You can find Christina on Twitter at Coffee Craft Code. So that's C O F F E E. C-R-A-F-T-C-O-D-E. Jake, you can find on Twitter at Jake Dome. So that's J-A-K-E-D-O-H-M. And me, you can find on Twitter at RoboCell. So it's uh, R-O-B-O-C-E-L-L. -L. As for the podcast, you can find us online at moderndotweb.com or on Twitter at modern.web. And lastly, of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Syncfusion and Progress, for sponsoring this podcast. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Jake. And we'll see you all next time.